very pleased to. This meeting is being recorded. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this workshop on, and I believe it's the last workshop of the conference. So I've got that honor of uh, kind of closing out the workshops. Um, well, to welcome you to this uh, Fit and Distributions in R, uh, the why and how of distribution fitting in R. And so today we're going to be hopefully uh, getting to the point where everybody can go through, understand what distributions are, uh, how, to, how and when they're used, how to sample from a distribution, and how to um, create a probability, fit a dis, uh, probability distribution to any data set. So I'm just going to come out of my presentation and just say, so hopefully um, if people haven't got R running on their own computer or they find that they have any issues with any of the packages that we're using, there is in Posit Cloud, there is the project workspace, which you should have been sent a link to um, with the information for the workshop. Um, this is the NHSR 2022 fitting distributions um, one, and you can create a project in there just by selecting project and new R Studio project. And that'll open an R Studio instance with all of the packages installed um, and I did test it yesterday so it should be all up and working and um, you can uh, run all the code that we're going to use in this session in Posit Cloud. Okay so yeah so we're going to go through uh, what is a distribution, when did you use a distribution, sampling data from a distribution, fitting data to a distribution, and then I'll uh, show you a little distribution uh, fitting uh, app templates that uh, I created in Shiny that's something that you can take and uh, extend and use yourselves uh, to help make distribution fitting a fun and easy task, he says. <laughs> okay, so what is a distribution? That's what we're here to talk about today. So it is a way to describe the shape of some data. Uh, and it describes the probability of any particular value occurring within uh, a given set of boundaries um, that are described by a data set. And it is a concise mathematical description of a curve that describes the spread of potential values. So what actually makes up a, a, a distribution? So if we just plot some raw data, <clears throat> like I've got here in this scatter plot, and here on the x-axis, we just got the index. So that's just the order in which this unsorted data set um, has, has been put together. And the values up on the y-axis. And that just shows that is unsorted data that kind of looks nonsensical. The next step when we look and kind of organize our data a little bit more is that we get a histogram. Um, histograms are very useful for looking at the shape of data as we'll see uh, during the workshop. And <clears throat> this starts to organize our data a little bit more and make a bit more sense of it. When we start thinking about probabilities and the probabilities of values occurring within a given distribution, we get something called a probability density function. And this, as you can see, is very similar to our um, histogram, but we've got density up on the y-axis. So it starts to transform the data from raw numbers into um, probabilities and the probability of a value occurring. And then we get something called a CDF, a cumulative density function. And this is how our data, uh, the probability of all the different values in our data actually occurring. 
and we'll see how this is useful during the workshop. So there are two main types or groups of distributions. We get discrete distributions and continuous distributions. And as the names um, kind of uh, allude to, uh, this is a, these are distributions for discrete data and for continuous data. So we get things called named distributions. These are what the uh, names that mathematicians have given to common shapes of data. And this allows us to quickly and concisely describe uh, the type of data that we might be looking at. And so with discrete distributions, we're talking about discrete data um, such as uh, values that don't use decimal points. So counts one, two, three, four, five, six, um, or categorical data uh, such as yes and no, or uh, Likert scale data. Um, these are commonly um, modeled or uh, their distributions are given using discrete named distributions. And here we see some examples such as the uniform distribution where the probability of each value occurring is the same. Here the Bernoulli distribution giving um, two values. So this is used for dictonomous data, just where it's got two values. And that's things like yes and no, binary decision making. Um, and here we see things like the geometric distribution where we've got this high value on the left hand side and then the probability of the other values decreases as the higher the value becomes. So we see these different shapes of curve and we'll look more at, at shapes and what the shapes of the data kind of mean in a bit. But just to say there's these discrete distributions for when you're using discrete data and these are some of the most common uh, named distributions. Then for a lot of data, a lot of data that we have, particularly time-based data, is continuous. Um, so that goes along and can be drawn on a continuous line. And here again, lots of named distributions for continuous data. So we th see things like the exponential distribution. Uh, we've got the normal distribution or Gaussian distribution here. Uh, log normals, a very common distribution. Uh, gamma and beta, again, very common distributions, um, as we'll see, that uh, are worth, worth looking at uh, when doing distribution fitting. But this just is to give you an idea of that we have all these named distributions and they come in these two different flavors of discrete and continuous distributions. So why do we use distributions? When, when do they get used? Well, a big use for them is in inferential statistics and they're used for hypothesis testing. Um, so that we can test whether something is significantly different from one thing to another. So like when we see uh, box plots with t-tests, that the box plot is the distribution of the data. Its whiskers are the, um, the outer bounds um, of the um, first and third quartiles. And so that we can see that range of the data <clears throat> but what's in there is that is the distribution of that data set. And uh, so when we're looking for overlaps between the range of value, possible values um, in hypothesis testing, um, that's we're looking, we're comparing the probability distributions. Uh, we use them for determining uncertainty as well. 
So uh, when we see uh, the average uh, value <clears throat> um, and we plot what is the, the common value, then we have our uncertainty bounds, our confidence limits. Those are uh, with decreasing probability that a value will fall within the range of your uncertainty bounds. And that is just, again, a probability distribution. Uh, we use them a lot for predictive modeling. They're put into uh, use for parameterizing models. Um, and <clears throat> I'll give a few more examples of that in a moment. And actually, the really useful probability distribution is really useful for data engineering and particularly for imputing missing data. So we can create a probability distribution of our known data and then sample from that to uh, impute missing values. Some real world applications for probability distributions. Well, they're used all the time in manufacturing process control. Um, so the uh, on automated uh, processing lines or any kind of production line, um, they're constantly monitoring what's the, uh, the amount of time it takes for different activities on the, pro on the processing line and um, plotting those. And if they fall outside of certain bounds um, or outside of the expected um, distribution of values, then they know they've got an issue. It's used in workflow planning. Um, so things like uh, the probability uh, of uh, the numbers of people in a supermarket or the number of um, planning for the number of cashiers that you need in a bank, um, because we can look at the probability of uh, a certain time of day being particularly busy or not busy. And that's how they do scheduling for uh, supermarkets and banks in particular. Uh, it's used in robotics, interestingly. Um, if uh, you'll have noticed that robots have stopped moving in such jerky motions and actually use smooth motions, um, all these new um, new uh, robots that are coming uh, coming out from the likes of um, Elon and uh, the big big tech companies and they use uh, probability distributions to control their uh, motor movements so rather than it's saying move it's saying move this much given a certain probability it's all very complex interactions between multiple probabilities and where the is um, so insurance, uh, all of your insurance is based on uh, probability distributions and whole sets of probability distributions that given a few input parameters, the probability of you're going to have an accident in this area um, or yeah, uh, that, that you're going to need to make a claim. Um, so insurance companies make heavy use of probability distributions. And of course, we use them in health service modeling. And I myself use probability distributions in health service modeling uh, all the time. And we use them for things like determining inter-arrival times. So this is the time between one, um, one person arriving and the next person arriving. And so for things like discrete event simulation, which I'm sure you saw lots of examples of at the conference. And the first, the way with a discrete event simulation to model uh, people coming into, uh, into your model or entities arriving into the model, we use inter arrival times and actually model the time between people arriving. determining how long an activity will take. Activities don't always take exactly the same amount of time. They fall between a particular range. So we can look at what that range is, count those up and model them as a, as a distribution. 
it's really useful for attributing characteristics to individuals. So probabilities of female, somebody falling within a particular age category um, or having being of a particular age um, for all kinds of uh, kind of demographics, um, demographic attribution within your data set, you can mo model that probability of somebody having a particular characteristic. Uh, determining the probability of a particular event occurring. So um, we can look at the distribution of somebody uh, actually, uh, so for example, uh, requiring an x-ray um, or requiring a, um, a particular treatment um, or their outcome being of a certain type. So these are just a few things that we can start to use distributions for. And these are the kinds of things that you might want to be modeling uh, within a particular, within a model, or just to be able to describe the shape of uh, a particular data set. So, we're going to start a little bit backwards. We're not going to fit a distribution, first of all. We're going to start by sampling from a distribution because the, the aim at the end of the day is to be able to use a probability distribution to sample from that distribution and use that information to uh, inform our models of them. So when we have uh, a known distribution, which has been taken from the fitting process, we need to be able to sample from that distribution for use in a model or algorithm. Um, and this is used, uh, achieved using uh, sampling functions for known distributions. So for most known distributions, there are built-in functions in R which is really helpful. And you'd kind of hope so, given that R was built as a, a statistics package that they would have uh, built in name distributions. And this is how we can randomly select uh, numbers from the defined distribution, given the probability of a particular value occurring within that distribution. And there are two main approaches for sampling from a known distribution. We can directly sample one or more values from a, dis from a known distribution, or we can generate a set of two or more values from a distribution and sample from these. Now, this might seem like a, a slight, oh, what's, why, why is this an important difference? Well, the one is the first approach is when you want to sample from the entire distribution of possible values um, and do that with replacement. So this means that every time that you select a value, that value then gets put back, back in the pot and has the same probability of occurring again. In the second approach, that's where we want to be able to predetermine the values that can be selected from. And then we can sample from that and we can do that with replacement or we can choose to do it without. And because sometimes you only want a particular value to occur just once. Um, and so that's useful when uh, selecting patient parameters or um, randomly selecting uh, patients to include in, in a model. If you're taking a sample, taking a sample of anything um, and where the characteristics are to be more unique to, uh, to a particular draw from the probability distribution. So sampling functions, we have, um, so the sampling functions tend to have the general form of 
the function name, the number of values to be sampled from the distribution, and then the keyword arguments for the distribution parameters. And it's these distribution parameters that we go through this whole fitting process to be able to determine. And this is kind of why we're starting with sampling from a distribution, because the whole aim of fitting, distribution fitting, is to get these parameters out so that we can then sample from that distribution. So with the, uh, for example, with the uniform distribution, the function name is run if, slightly odd, um, but they, that's what it's always been. Um, <laughs> um, there's probably some strange history there to why it's called run if, but we can use the function run if to sample from the uniform distribution. And because the probability of every value uh, in the distribution being selected is the same, the parameter values are the upper and lower bounds of the distribution, so the minimum and the maximum values. Ah, thank you, John T. Do you know what? I've always read it as run if. <laughs> it's not, it's all you know. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> oh, I've, uh, that's totally changed the way that I'm going to look at that function name. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, here we can see with the uniform function um, that we've got um, the number of values to be selected from the distribution, the minimum uh, value of the distribution, so the lower bound, and the maximum value, the upper bound. Now, so the uniform distribution is a very simple one, but the parameters then a different for every name distribution. Um, so here we see examples of the normal, the exponential, Poisson and log normal distributions. And we can see that they use the same format. So we've got the number of uh, values to sample from the distribution and then the parameter keyword arguments. So for the normal distribution, it's the mean and the standard deviation. For the exponential, we have a rate parameter, which is the rate of change over the curve. The Poisson takes a lambda parameter and the log normal takes the mean log and the standard deviation log values. And it's these values that determine the shape of the distribution. Okay, so we're going to have a look in a minute at um, how these different values change the shape of the distribution. But I'm just going to talk quickly about um, sampling from uh, distribution. So if we want to sample the distribution values that we've created. So for example, we take 100 values from the normal distribution, and then we want to sample from those values. The arguments for this function are the vector of values from which we want to sample, the uh, number of values that we want to sample from, uh, from those values, and whether we're sampling with or without replacement, and that's just a Boolean value of uh, true or false. And so it's with this function sample that we can select this. And sample is drawing from this vector of values using the normal distribution, uh, using the uniform distribution. So it will, um, any value has the same probability of being sampled from our vector, but because our vector of values was drawn from a particular distribution, there will be more or less of a particular value in 
that vector that we've created. So just for a bit of a starter for uh, to get everybody going and to, to have a bit of play with these functions, just for um, about seven minutes, because it's it, this doesn't need 10 minutes, but it could use longer than five minutes. So we'll go with seven minutes. Um, just going to have you look, try creating different distributions using the name distribution functions. Change the input arguments uh, on the uh, parameters and look at what the impact of changing those is on the shape of the data by plotting it using a histogram. And so that's just using the, the hist function. And try changing the number of uh, bins or breaks uh, in your histogram to get different levels of resolution on the sampled data. So I'll just show you an example of this for anybody who's not done this before. So here, just, uh, just zoom in a bit. So here I've using the random normal um, function, selecting 100 values, mean of five, standard deviation of 1.5, and then plotting it using the hist function where I'm passing in that vector of values and then determining the number of breaks or breakpoints for the uh, for the histogram. And so if I run that, I can see that I get my histogram of this data here. So have a play. Um, I'm going to call you back at um, 1040. Um, and if anybody has any questions or anything, pop them in the chat or just uh, feel free to, to speak up and um, ask your questions. I'll be here um, and I'll try and answer them. So have a go at that. And I'll see you back here at 1040.
Okay, so if I can start drawing everybody's attention back, hopefully, if you've gone through, created a couple of different distributions, plotted them, and changed the parameters about, you'll have seen that one, the distributions create different shapes of data, but more importantly, small changes to the parameters can create really quite different shapes to the distribution itself. And this is why it is important that we do create, uh, that we do distribution fitting properly. And this is why we need to go through this process to be able to get the correct parameters out to fit our data. So how do we go through and get these different parameters so that we can correctly uh, determine the shape of our data. So we start by looking at the shape of the data. First of all, we fit our data to likely distributions and we check the fit of the data. So it's a, re it's a reasonably straightforward process, but there are a few more steps in there. A few, few things to think about, first of all, why can't I just use my real data? Why use a distribution at all? Well, there's, a very good there's some very good reasons for this. Your real data is only a sample, often only a sample of all possible values of the actual population itself. And so we create the distribution to capture what those other values might actually be. Uh, the use of real data in stochastic models causes overfitting. And this means that we, again, we're just looking at what our sample is. Um, we're not looking at what other values it could possibly take. And we need that variation to better approximate the population. What do I do when multiple distributions or no distributions fit my data very well? And this is very common. So distribution fitting is as much an art as it is a science, particularly for practical real world distribution fitting with healthcare data in particular, because it's messy. Um, it comes from human systems, which have large amounts of variation in them. And the whole process relies on interpretation, experience, and perseverance, to be honest. Um, we, you do have to just keep trying different distributions and tweak them until they work with your data. It's an iterative process. Sometimes you've got large amounts of data. It's nice now, you know, everybody's like big data. Yeah, oh yeah, large data sets. We've got, we've got a million data points. Should you use them all for distribution fitting? No, definitely not. Um, again, too many data points will actually cause overfitting. Uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, we tend to use between 2,000 and 10,000 data points to fit a distribution. Um, there's probably some good statistical reason for that. Um, <laughs> I'm not a statistician. Um, so it's really, it's about minimizing that overfitting, but we've also got the trade-off because the greater the variation that we have in our data, uh, the more data that we actually need to capture that variation. So it's about ensuring that your sample of data fairly represents your uh, larger sample of data. So if you have a million data points and you select 10,000 from them, you should be seeing a similar um, shape to the data. But if you're not seeing that, then you need to select more data points and you might need to go to 20,000 or 30,000 data points to be able to capture what seems to be the overall trend in your whole sample of data. Okay, so first thing, as I said, we look at the shape of our data. And 
it's about making a simple plot of the data to look at the shape of it. So, well, this is an unsorted scatter plot, just so that we can, we're looking at that we've got more val lower values here. Um, and we've got some in the middle and some and just a few higher values. So we're already seeing a bit of a trend in the data, but it's not that clear. Oh, just to say, so all of this code that I'm going to show you is in the uh, contained in the uh, uh, task folder. Um, it's the uh, distribution fitting task code, and it's I've, I've, it's all in there, all written out for you, so you don't have to try and frantically type this down or copy it out or anything like that. Um, yeah, uh, enjoy, or you can uh, try it as you're going along um, and and create these plots that we're doing. Um, so here we're just uh, sampling. I'm just sampling some data for demonstration purposes from uh, the log normal distribution, and taking a thousand data points from a log normal distribution with a mean log of 2.7 and a standard deviation log of um, 0.6. And so, yeah, we're seeing this rough shape in our scatter plot. A histogram is the more useful way to view your data. And it, we're just going to use, uh, I'm just using GG plot for a change to uh, create a histogram. And you could just use the base R hist function as well. So when we plot this data as a histogram, we start to see this trend that we saw in the scatter plot of more lower values, uh, some in the middle and fewer higher values um, within the data. So we're starting to see this this curve, this shape of the data. So what are you looking for in your data? And these, these are the kind of standard things that you want to be looking at uh, when first just visually appraising your real data. So is it symmetrical? Looking for symmetry in the data will tell you if it's likely to be a normal or Gaussian distribution. Um, so that's where your mean is in the middle, the mean, the median, and the mode all sit in the middle. Um, and it's a symmetrical uh, curve. Is it positively or negatively skewed? So when I say skewed, I mean, is the, uh, the median, uh, sorry, the modal value uh, off to the left or to the right. So uh, positively skewed is when it's towards the y-axis and negatively skewed is when it's further away from your y-axis. Um, is there one or more modal values? So the mode being the most common when I, uh, when I use the term mode. Uh, so sometimes you get bimodal or trimodal values, and there are name distributions to fit them. Um, it's slightly more complicated, but there, uh, yeah, is there one or more modes? And that's something that you've got to got to be aware of, um, as as that is really key to determining exactly which distributions you're you're fitting. Um, is the mode the lowest or the highest value? If it is, then it's likely it's going to be an exponential distribution. And it's kind of in this way that it's about, this is where experience comes in, in appraising what, um, what likely distributions are going to fit our data. Because it's down to you to determine which distributions to try and fit. 
So asking these questions when looking at your data will help you to determine that. So here we can see characteristics wise that we don't have symmetry of the data. Our data is positively skewed here. So, and our mode, we have a single modal uh, value and that's towards the y-axis. And that's telling us that, so it's not going to be an exponential distribution as our mode is not the most, uh, not the lowest value. It's not going to be um, a normal distribution. Um, and it's not by it's not a bimodal distribution. So we've got different choices then. And knowing that this data has come from uh, the log normal distribution, this is the shape that we'd expect to see. But it could also be, and we'll see in a minute, that things like the gamma distribution as well would fit this data well. Okay. Time to get a bit more complicated and start using some R functions to uh, understand our um, our probability distribution. So, from the uh, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> do you know what I've forgotten the name of the package? Let me just fit dist R plus from this package. This is the core package. The fit dist r plus package is our absolute savior for distribution fitting as it contains some lovely functions for distribution fitting so the plot dist function will allow us to look at the probability density function and the cumulative density function of our data and so the pdf the probability density function shows us the empirical density of, um, of our uh, values. So the probability of them occurring within the data. And the cumulative distribution, the CDF, um, adds up the probability density of the observations as a smooth curve. And so the plot disk function takes the input of a vector of data, our data. And I recommend putting in, so we say, do we want the histogram of uh, the data? It's always useful to plot that with the empirical density and to plot the um, empirical density on that histogram. So setting both of those to true. And so if, I, if we put our data into the, into the plot disk function, we get these two graphs of our PDF on the left and our CDF on the right. And this is what um, this is what's going to be used to fit our distributions. This is the, the input. It's using this probability density function and cumulative distribution um, to test against different theoretical uh, densities, which is what we're going to do next. So this is always your starting point to create this, uh, these, these uh, PDFs and CDFs. Now, what we're going to do next is look and assess our data um, in terms of uh, what distributions might fit in terms of skewness, so that's the positive or negative skew of the data, and the ketosis, which is the sharpness of the peak of the curve. So the sharpness of this, the peak of this curve here, the empirical density. And this is done using something called a Cullen and Frey graph. And we can create one of these graphs using this function here, desk, uh, descri describe distribution, desk dist. And again, we pass in our data. If you're using discrete data, 
and fitting discrete distributions, you need to change this to true. Uh, but we're using continuous data here, so we set that to false. And this is a, um, a simulation method that, so we use bootstrapping with it. And I tend to set the bootstrap value to 500 um, as that doesn't take too long to run, um, but also seems to be often about, about the right level. Um, if you've got lots, if you're using a larger data set, um, you'll probably want to uh, reduce the bootstrapping as it will take a bit longer. So Cullen and Frey graph. Now, this is what a Cullen and Frey graph looks like when we run it. And what we're doing is it's basically, it's testing our data against a whole lot of different distributions here. Um, so it's testing them against the common uh, name distributions. So we're testing against the normal distribution, uniform, exponential, uh, logistic, beta, log normal, and gamma distributions. Uh, and the uh, Vival distribution noted here is uh, close to the gamma and log normal distributions. So that's saying that if, if you're thinking of testing log normal and gamma distributions, then you should probably test Weevil as well. So what are we looking at here? So on these, uh, on the X and Y axis here, we have the square of the skewness on the X and uh, kurtosis on the Y axis. So remembering skewness is how skewed left and right our data is and kurtosis is the sharpness of the peak. So if we look, we've got our um, observation. So this is uh, the uh, square of the skew and the kurtosis for our data here is the blue dot. The bootstrapping is done and that produces um, data around our uh, observed values. So slightly adjusting the values left and right, uh, up and down uh, a bit. And then we've got these different markers for the different distributions um, that are being tested against it. So if our um, data was normal, uniform, or logistic, then the blue dot would be up here by the uh, the triangle, the asterisk, and the plus symbol, and would fall on one of the, or near one of those. The beta distribution is this shaded area here. So our if it was likely to be a beta distribution, then our obs observation would fall within the shaded area. As it is, our uh, observation and the bootstrap values are falling along the dashed line, the log normal distribution, and kind of close to, um, oh, uh, sorry, gamma is the dashed line. It falls close to the dashed line gamma distribution and the smaller dashes uh, dashed line being the log normal. It also falls near to the exponential distribution here, which is this box with a cross in. So this graph, the Cullen and Frey graph here is actually saying, oh, your data looks like it might be a gamma distribution, a log normal distribution, or an exponential distribution. because our um, observation of bootstrap values are falling more closely to these, uh, these lines, these indicators on uh, given the skewness and the ketosis. So this gives us um, a, a, an easy way to be able to start testing distributions. We, 
we know which are the most likely distributions um, for us to start with. So now, fitting your data. Uh, so now we've got an idea of what um, distributions we want to test. Now we've got to go through the process of testing them. And the process is that we, we fit the data to the likely distributions and get the uh, theoretical uh, values for that. And then we go through and we go through a visual assessment of the fit using the theoretical probability density function and cumulative density functions of our fitted distributions. We use QQ plots, which is a comparison of the quantiles um, and is, is, is uh, considered the, uh, the most sensitive uh, way to uh, assess your fit. And the PP plot, which is a comparison of the, uh, the CDFs of the cumulative density functions, the theoretical cumulative density function against the empirical one. Then we're going to go through and calculate goodness of fit and uncertainty estimates of our distributions, fitted distributions. And then you go through and you select, and then you can select the best fitting distribution and, and extract those parameters that we can feed in to our model or into our um, uh, our random sampling um, function that we used at the beginning. Or we might need to go back and retest using different distributions because the ones we tested didn't fit. So fitting the data. Now, this is where we're um, doing our uh, kind of first purposeful uh, fits of, of, our data, of, of different distributions to our data. And for this, we use the fit dist function. Uh, and, and that um, takes, uh, again, our vector of data. And we put a, give a string for the names distribution that we want to test. Um, so the way that it's going to do the fitting is by using the maximum likelihood estimate method. And this is the default method uh, used by the fit disk function. It is a good generic estimation method but there are a few different uh, different fitting methods that can be used, and they're given in the documentation for the uh, FitDist R plus package. And you can go through and have a look at them and and have a play and see where where and when uh, other approaches might be more uh, uh, suitable, but. As a standard kind of broad brush, maximum likelihood estimate is often good enough. Um, and within the documentation as well, it's also got listed all of the name distributions that can be used with the FitDist function. And I think uh, in the uh, distribution fitting code, I have given all of the distribution names here that can be used with the fit dist function. So when we um, run the fit dist function uh, here with the uh, Beeble um, distribution, we get this output. So here we're getting our maximum likelihood parameters. So these are actually our the parameters that we'd be using um, to describe the curve. And these would go in if we were uh, using the uh, named Weevil function to sample from the distribution. These are the parameters that it would take. Um, 
and we've got standard error for those as well um, and a few different uh, values here that we'll look at in more detail in a bit. So that's fitting one distribution at a time, but actually it's more efficient to uh, fit multiple distributions and compare them. So we were looking at, uh, from our Cullen and Frey graph, we were seeing that actually the gamma distribution seems to fit our data very well, the log normal distribution and the Weeble. So we can just fit them using uh, a loop. Uh, this is, I'm used to, to loops, um, but there, we could do this using an apply method as well. Um, and here we're just listing out our distribution strings and then passing them into the uh, fit disk function and then returning it as a list, uh, a list of our outputs. And here this loops just printing those summaries out. And what we get is the multiple summaries of our different distributions, our gamma, log normal, and Vival distributions fitted to our data. So these are what we're going to go through and compare in a minute. But rather than jumping straight in to looking at the numbers, what we also want to produce is um, from this, these, these fittings, uh, we want to produce our um, theoretical PDFs, CDFs, our QQ plots, and our PP plots as well. Um, so here we go through and we use the um, density comparison function, dense comp, and we pass in our fitted um, parameters. And we're also passing in here um, legend text. So this is uh, the names of the distributions, uh, which is created using this um, variable here, plot.legend, um, and the string of the different distribution names. And so we're passing that in, and we're getting our density comparison, our CDF comparison, our QQ comparison, our PP comparison. And I've also got it here that you can do it as a four by four grid. That's what this first line is. Um, but you can also just remove that and uh, plot them individually. So here we're comparing the PDFs, so the probability density functions. So we've got our real data, and then we've got different colored lines for the gamma, log normal, and VBOL distributions. And we can see how closely they each visually fit the data. And at this point, you'd be going, oh, the gamma seems like a really good fit to this data. Seems to reach the top here um, and seems to, seems to fit reasonably well. Now, this is why we use multiple methods for appraising the fit of data rather than just one single uh, approach. Because yeah, that does look like it fits pretty well, but it's not um, a done deal. If we look at the CDF now, I'm just gonna come out and zoom in a little bit on this. So on the CDF, comparison of the cumulative density functions, we actually see that the gamma distribution is underestimating, that's the red line here, is underestimating the cumulative density function. And actually the log normal fits much better along our, uh, our empirical cumulative density function. And Vibel is off in multiple places. So we're trying to fit along these lines. Next, we get our QQ plot comparison. And here we're comparing um, the quantiles. And that what we're looking for 
is the colored dots to line up as close as possible along the diagonal line here. And again, you can see quite clearly that the log normal in green is lining up much better than the gamma and the V-ball distributions. And then our PP plot. So this is looking at the uh, from the cumulative density function. Um, and this is where we're looking to minimize the residuals. Um, so that difference between the lines. And again, we're looking for our dots to line up along the diagonal line here. And you can see that the log normal lines up really quite nicely along that line, whereas the uh, people and gamma distributions deviate from that line in more places. So it's this deviation, this lining up that we're looking for when we're visually assessing across these four different plots. Next, we can do some. Uh, uh, now we can look at our goodness of fit statistics um, as another way of assessing our fit. And sorry. Uh, so for this, we use um, the GOF stat function. We pass in our fit parameters and we use uh, also passing the keyword fit names so that it labels our different um, goodness of fit statistics appropriately. And so when we get, view this output, we get three different statistics calculating the goodness of fit in slightly different ways. Um, these, they're all looking at the deviation from the theoretical distributions from the real data. Um, and we're aiming to minimize these statistical values in each instance. Um, so that's across all of uh, the goodness of fit statistics and the goodness of fit criteria here as well. So when we look across these for each of the distributions, we can see that in each instance, the log normal distribution has the lower value for each of the goodness of fit statistics, indicating that that is a better fitting distribution. So we've got some quite good, oops, sorry. Um, we can see quite well that it seems that our uh, the log normal distribution is fitting the best. If we go and we look at the goodness of fit calculations in more detail um, in the uh, data explorer in our studio, we can see that there's a whole lot more information that's computed behind the scenes as well. And it actually goes in uh, to the point where it gives outcomes of the tests itself. Um, and we can see that for two of the tests, um, there's rejected, rejected, not computed, rejected, not computed, rejected. But for the Kamilogov Smirnov test, I can never say that properly, the KS test, um, we get uh, the gamma gets rejected and the V ball gets rejected, but our um, our log normal distribution is not rejected as the best fitting one. So that, again, mathematically is saying that seems like a good fit and falls within the bounds of what I consider as mathematically a good fitting, fitting distribution. You won't, sometimes you will just not be able to get that with uh, real world data. Um, don't be disheartened, go for a good fit distribution is what I say. But we do have these statistical tests there, um, which will give you the statistical significance of the fit. Um, then we can go on to calculate parameter uncertainty for our distributions. And this is done using the boot dist function. 
So this is a bootstrapping simulation um, to estimate confidence intervals for the parameters. Um, and this is useful for bounding and tweaking the distribution parameters when implementing them in a the model. Sometimes you'll take a distribution, you'll plug it into, uh, into your model, and it won't match up quite as well as you'd like with um, what uh, the kind of outputs that you're expecting in your baseline model. And we can use uh, these confident intervals as the bounds for tweaking our parameters and trying to get them just to line up with our baseline expectations of our model a bit better. Um, so this little bit of code just runs uh, the uh, big disk uh, function for all three fits. It takes, again, the fit parameters, um, and it's just running in a small loop here. Um, and we're printing out our summary estimates with our distribution name given above as well. So here's the output for that. So here we get our median parameters uh, for each of the uh, distributions that we're testing and our upper and lower confidence bounds, confidence interval as well. Okay, so the aim of this whole process has been to gain the parameters for a distribution that's been fitted to your real world data. These parameters are found in the fit dist function um, output under estimate. Um, and you can refine the distribution when applying in practice uh, using the upper and lower bounds of those uncertainty estimates. So Thinking back to how this data was created, uh, being drawn from a log normal distribution using parameters of mean log 2.7 and standard deviation log 0.6, we can see that the, um, the fitted distribution parameters, our estimate is 2.68 and 0.57. So they're reasonably close to our original parameters from which this distribution is drawn. But then if we look at our, um, our, our confidence intervals for this, they actually, uh, are, again, are pretty close to uh, uh, the mean log spans uh, 2.64 to um, 2.71 or 2.72. And oh, sorry. And um, so that shows that little bit of movement that you might have to have in order to get it to match up well. Um, and the standard deviation log is, again, it gets pretty close to 0 0.6 here. So in terms of being certain that we, uh, that this process is estimating our parameters well, we can be pretty certain of that. Okay. I want you to have a go at this now. I have left enough time. I managed to get through quickly enough. Um, so there is the, you've got the code, the fitting task code that was uh, from the GitHub repo, um, or that's contained in the POSIT cloud project as well. Um, go through and have a go at running this code using the, uh, there's two different CSV files See if you can go through and work out which uh, distribution each of these data sets has been drawn from. Um, don't forget to set your working directories appropriately. Um, even if you're using POSIT Cloud, you still need to set the working directory um, as there is no preface, um, no file path given, obviously, for the data sets. So um, basically, I'm here for any questions. Um, have a go. Um, we'll come back uh, just a few minutes before half past. I'll call everybody back. Um, and I'll go th just wrap up uh, quickly and just show you a, um, a shiny app template that I've created for doing this as well. But go through, have a go, ask any questions. We're here. Thank you.
Okay, so I'm just aware of time. So um, hopefully what you'll see in that fitting task code actually is that you know, this can be used as a template for your own distribution fitting and something that you can use to have a little practice, um, you know, create your own uh, sample from a name distribution, uh, try fitting your own real world data um, and go through, use that process um, and use the process that uh, I've described today and that will should get you pretty far with um, being able to fit your own distributions. Um, now there is a package, a couple of things to mention, there is a package called um, Actuar and this actually contains some more named distributions and some odd ones. It doesn't work with all um, uh, with all versions of R, um, unless it's, I hope it's been updated because it's actually a really handy package, um, but it wasn't working with the latest version. So um, you might have to use a slightly older version of R in order to be a base R in order to be able to run that package if you do need to use it. Um, but again, the link to the documentation is here. So one last thing that I just want to show you is that um, so distribution fitting, it's not an exact science when working with real world data. A uh, statistician would like to tell you that it is and it should be, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's, it is uh, an iterative uh, process relying on that experience of testing and, and a good bit of perseverance. Um, so I've, I wrote a little um, app in Shiny to, uh, so this, you've got, uh, you've got this uh, app.r text, which will be in the um, app template files. And that's got the app and some example app data as well. And this is just a simple shiny app where you can upload some data and it will plot the empirical density, cumulative density uh, function, the Cullen and Frey graph for you. And then you can select distributions to test it against. And so you, you can select multiple distributions to test and whether you want goodness of fit and uncertainty parameters. And then it will plot out here your theoret theoretical um, density functions, uh, the QQ plots and PP plots as well. Um, and then in the tables you've got, it will um, take a moment, but it will produce all the Cullen and Frey summary, fit summaries, goodness of fit, uncertainty estimates, the whole lot. And this could be taken, extend it. Um, I haven't done discrete distributions with it. That one, That's one uh, good extension to do to it. Um, but please take that and use it yourselves. Um, so uh, just so at the end of the presentation, you've got, again, links to the documentation there for you. Um, and I'll just give a plug for r4healthcare.org, which uh, website that I run um, with a whole load of our training on there. Um, yeah, just things that, I've found, that we found useful. Uh, this training's up there, there's training on Shiny, principal component analysis. Um, yeah, uh, have a little look at that. Um, but yeah, happy, if anybody wants to stay on for any questions, I'm happy to hang around for, uh, for a bit and answer any questions. Otherwise, Thank you very much for your attention today. Fantastic. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Sean. Cheers. Thank you. Uh,
no, thank you very much, everybody. That's great. That's great to hear that feedback as well. I hope that was useful and yeah, gives you an applied way to get out there and be be doing distribution fitting by this afternoon. Well, I wouldn't necessarily go that far. <laughs> A bit more practical. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you very much. That's really, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. everything's in the GitHub repo, and I think this recording will be going up as well, so you can always go back over that. Great. Well, if there aren't any questions, then we'll end the session. And um, Sean, Sean, are you okay if we contact you if you do have any issues with trying to do this sort of work? Oh, absolutely. That's perfectly fine. Um, I'm very easy to find. Um, Sean Manzi, Exeter University. You'll you'll um, find my email. Um, yeah, I'm easy to get hold of, and I'm on Slack as well. That's the other one. So NHSR Slack, you can get a hold of me directly through there. Yeah, I did have one question I didn't want to throw into the chat earlier on, but it was about the Cullen and Frey uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Why did they choose that? So <laughs> there's there's a couple of different. Um, similarish approaches. I think it's just one that's that particular package. They went with the Cullen and Frey approach for estimating it uh, back when the package was built. Um, but it's I think it's the breadth that you get with that approach. And it's quite, once you get used to looking at it, it's quite easy to interpret yeah. as well. Um, and, and it being based on the skew and the ketosis, which are your two core um, kind of pro sh things, things that give away what type of distribution it's going to be and can be used to uh, distinguish between different distributions quite well. Um, yeah, that how sharp the peak is and where it is <laughs> um, really um, helps. Uh, is an oversimplified way of looking mm -hmm. at the distribution, but as a first rough check um, to give you an indicator of what um, distributions to go for, it seems to work quite well. But actually, if you look online, there's quite a lot of controversy around the Cullen and Frey approach, and then it's not. <laughs> even, and it's also some people say that it shouldn't be called the Cullen and Frey graph either, um, because. <laughs> um, Somebody else created it before them. <laughs> well, that's it. And I think as soon as some things become successful, everyone wants to sort of, oh, but I got there first and they, they were my mentor and this is a great place to go to. And I mean, competition is good to a point, isn't it? But I think when we're trying to represent things to clinicians and senior management, you need, I, mean, I think the visual representation is really good. It was like a light bulb went off in the head. I mean, well, that looks really clever. And it sort of gets rid of some of the sort of mystifying process, doesn't it? Absolutely. That's it. All that we're doing is we're looking for those deviations from uh, our real data. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and that's, yeah, it's it's just, uh, yeah, fitting, fitting those curves. And that's what, uh, it's, it's, it's no more complicated than that in a way, which is, um, it's just, how you check and compare i think it's having you know i've kind of built this up over uh, several years that using all these different approaches really helps you to distinguish especially when working with messier data or smaller samples um just to help you to be able to uh, work out in the real world what what uh distributions we should be using um yeah we don't have nice perfect data as you also often get in a you know kind of a uh, yes. production line yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 things things with smaller amounts of variability yeah and the, and the beauty is if we can go to sort of senior management say okay we'll follow this process and we've not just made it up we're following somebody else's um, sort of approaches and they, they've spent years developing it and sort of making it better and that'll, that'll go gain some credence and some breathing space rather than instant challenges. Why have we done this? We go, uh, because I saw it in a book. 
you can find colleagues in the community that have done it as well. Yeah. Get some good, good use of cases. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so, great. Jinsy, Jinsy, do you want to say hello to Sean? This is Jinsy who's working with me as part of our data science team. Ah, uh, right. Hi there, Jinsy. Nice to meet you. So Jinsy was at conference as well last week. Right. Okay. Hi there. I'm, I'm hopefully, uh, yeah. Um, ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That'll um that'll be useful and uh, again, um, yeah I think it's just it's it's being able to do this like you don't have to understand all the complex maths in the background, that's prohibitive. With with this, that's for statisticians to argue about. <laughs> what we can do is make use of what are these fantastic R tools for doing. Yeah. Uh, doing this yeah i mean yeah i've never found a better package than the um fit to star plus package it just is so well built <laughs> um, oh, oh i think jinsey's Jinsy connected to audio come on jinsey hello can you hear me <laughs> i'm so sorry can you, can you hear me guys yes we can hear you yes can you hear us hi Sean. hi how are you Good, thanks, Jensi. Very good. It was a very good section. Yeah. Oh, good, good. I'm glad glad you enjoyed it. That's, uh... So we we'll, we'll yeah. might be looking for some help, Sean, with uh, when we're trying to convert our reality to um, something we can present to people. But I think yeah. um, it's a great start, what you've seen today. It's been great. Yeah, please do get in, get in touch. Um, yeah, more than happy um, to... Uh, help out however I can um, uh, provide a bit of advice and uh, the other one when you get good at this please do use this you know um, happy to share this training you know and take it use it within your yeah. own organization that's um I think that's is a brilliant one to be able to do okay should we stop recording now <laughs> yeah <laughs> probably should great <laughs>